Ben Stonemeyer Games, and I'm here as usual on Wednesday for an hour, just to spend an hour with you talking about Stonemeyer Games news, to uh, to share some random stuff that's going on in my in my life, mostly you know, movies, books, things like that, and um, and answer your questions, of course. If you have any questions, non-spoiler questions about things that are going on at Stonemeyer Games or in general, I'm happy to discuss them here, and I hope to hear your answers as well. Uh, what is going on here? So. And I'll talk about a few little fun things here. Inconsequential fun things first. Um, I had a great disc golf round this past weekend. Or not, I, I didn't personally have a great round. I had a fun round and I played with some friends at, uh, at New Melly here in St. Louis. Or just outside St. Louis. And we also had, we've had beautiful weather here. I posted about this on Instagram today. So we also played at Unger uh, last week. And I'm looking forward to playing this week. And I might, if you're watching this and you're attending Geekway next week, I might try to coordinate a, uh, a, a round of disc golf on the Sunday of Geekway, if anyone's interested in, in playing or learning. or, or Yeah, uh, Sunday is usually kind of a, a, a lower key day at the Geekway convention here in St. Louis. So thinking about doing that. Um, and also this past weekend, we had a cookbook club. So this is a, a, something that we've been doing with some friends where... We collectively pick a single cookbook and we each pick a recipe from that cookbook and bring a dish to a shared meal, kind of a potluck style. Um, and we all get to eat the same, uh, different food from the same cookbook. And uh, we've had a lot of fun, fun with it. And this past weekend, we did one from a Dungeons and Dragons, kind of an official, I think, an official Dungeons and Dragons cookbook. So that each uh, dish was classified by like elves or dwarves or things like that. And I made a dwarven flatbread, flatbread and I made an elven, a wood elf uh, salad, a fresh salad. And all the other dishes, all, I think my dishes turned out fine and all the other dishes were, were delicious as well. It was a fun way to do kind of a, uh, a potluck meal that has a, a cohesive theme as well. I see Nathan and George here this morning, um, two people who often play uh, Rolling Realms along with me. Or at least Nathan, and both Nathan and George are Rolling Realms fan designers, and they have some realms uh, for Game 50. I'll be playing Game 50 of, or live play Game 50 for Rolling Realms in the near future, and both Nathan and George had realms selected, I believe, if I'm remembering that correctly. That game isn't this week, though. Game 49 is this week. So this afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, then Thursday and Friday, both on, uh, first on the Rolling Realms Facebook group, and then on YouTube soon afterward, very soon afterward. I will do live plays of those realms. Today we have, what do we have? The Isle of Cats. We have Ark Nova and Biddy and Walter. So a few, all promo realms actually for this one. I, I always just randomize the realm to determine what we're going to play for the next uh, two sessions. So I make sure that we get all the all the realms in circulation. Um, but yeah, that's the, the random assortment for today's, or this week's game. And specifically t today's round. Blake is popping in to say hi. He says, hope you're well. Really enjoyed your synopsis video on the Star Wars battle, uh, not battle, sorry, the Star Cruiser weekend. Take care. Thank you, Blake. Yeah, that was my video from this past Sunday. I did a long video about my experience the previous weekend on the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser mega game experience in Orlando, Florida. I, I had a wonderful time. I raved for a long time about how much I enjoyed the many different levels of immersion of the experience. And I give some kind of tips for people who might be considering doing the experience as well. And there's even a spoiler section in the video, but it's clearly marked spoiler, so you don't spoil any of the plot points for yourself if you if you care about that. Um, but thank you, Blake. I'm glad you enjoyed that video. I had fun filming it. And uh, yeah, yeah. It, still uh, one of the best games that I've played this year, for sure. Anthony is here. Good morning, Anthony. George says he's looking forward to, roll, to Rolling Realms Game 50. Good morning, Steven, Tony. Uh, Nathan says he's also excited to play Game 50, which is all fan realms. Jerry says, I just watched the documentary Crafting Arzium um, about Ryan Lockett and, and Ma uh, Mallory Lockett. I had Melanie in my head for some reason, but Mal Mallory Lockett. Mallory does a lot of the writing for the storybook games that Ryan designs. Uh, Jerry says, opening a window into their lives and game design works at Red Raven. Red Raven. Do you think you would ever do a documentary on Stomeyer and yourself? Yeah, I believe I watched this documentary. I'm pretty sure I backed it and, and watched it. I have a terrible memory, though. Um, Jerry, I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, in I remember like around the time that Scythe came out, I had a few people ask if they could do a documentary about me and Stillmire Games. And I was flattered that they would ask that. 
Um, but it is a, uh, and I, I love that Ryan did it. For me, I feel like it would be a distraction. Like a lot of my work is just spent at this table right now doing stuff like this, either creating content or working on game design and game development or project management. Like a lot of it is me just staring at screens. And I don't think it's, uh, I, I, I don't think it's particularly documentary worthy. So I'd have to go out of my way to look like I'm doing documentary like things. Um, and playtesting would, would work for that. I do plenty of playtesting that would work for the film. But I don't know. I, I, I don't want to add anything that would distract myself from my core focus at Stillmeyer Games. Um, I do see the added benefit that a documentary, that documentary can add, it can generate more attention for a company if it's uh, done well and it's uh, played for people who wouldn't normally have access to the company. Um, and I think there's something to be said with seeing that type of content, like being able to look back on it. So Ryan now has something that he can look back on 10, 20 years in the future and look at how he was in the past, which I think is really cool. Long answer short, Jerry, I don't think it's something that I would consider doing because of the, um, because it wouldn't lead to, I think it would distract from what I, the core of what I need to do every day. And I don't think it would make a great film just because of how much time I spend in front of the screen every day. Yeah. Um, hopefully I can provide some of those inside scoops based on these types of chats and other videos that I film. I want to do a video soon about, so I have a video about like 10 steps to design a board game. And I have a, a video about four steps to pitching a game to a, a game publisher. I want to do a video about 10 steps about how to create a board game publishing company. It'll be tough to boil it down to 10 things because I have, you know, hundreds of blog posts about that topic. But maybe I, I, I think I can boil it down to, to 10 things um, for the purpose of the video, at least as a starting point, as many of these videos are. Good morning, Nancy Jane. Uh, Yoa says, just had the opportunity to try Hegemony. Um, what a game. Have you tried it? The political theme is very well implemented. I have not tried it yet. I've heard great things about it, and I'm very curious to try it in the near future. Good morning, Barry. Uh, Anthony says, his wife and I started house ruling red for a first time for a first time player in scythe. What are your thoughts? Do you think that's a good way to, inter to introduce to turn flow, or do you think we're spoiling them? Anthony, that's a good question. I do like the idea of... Um, onboarding people into Scythe, for example, any game, but Scythe in particular, given the asymmetry, in in a way that is easier for them to play. Um, and I think the Rusviat faction, the, the red faction, is a good way to do that because they have a, a little bit more flexibility than other players. They can choose the same section of the player mat on, uh, on sequential turns. Um, the only thing I recommend is using that as an opportunity to show the player that normally they can't do that. That is an exception to the rule. It is just for the red faction that they can they can choose that same section over and over again. So, but I have I have definitely taught Scythe and given a beginner player that same faction for that exact reason that you mentioned. So I think that is a good way to go. Nathan says, I haven't played as much Rolling Realms recently because I have been trying to make a Wingspan version that my little kids, ages 3 through 5, can play with us. Yeah, Nathan, I saw you post this on the Wingspan Facebook group and on Board Game Geek uh, called the Fledgling. Is that right? Uh, Fledgling? He says, they love to look at the birds but haven't ever gotten to really play before. Nathan, I think that's wonderful that you're trying to make a version of the game for that purpose. It's something that we've played around with a bit too. Um, and uh, yeah. I don't want to talk spoilers, but there there are some things that we are exploring to create a version of Wingspan or versions of Wingspan that are uh, that are not language independent, for example, and that uh, remove some of the um, I don't know the the rules overhead that Wingspan requires of of players. And I think you touch upon a bunch of them in your your detailed board game geek post on the subject. What I thought was that that was really well done. George says he still listens to my podcast during coffee in the morning. Interesting about the latest one about successful campaign advice. Yeah. So George is actually one of the people that inspired me to do a podcast version of, uh, of my, my blog in the first place. So, uh, yeah. So th this past, what, what are the last two blog posts I did? The main one. Okay. So last Thursday I did talk about the immersion, the inclusivity and the personal nature the customized nature, like kind of the personalization nature of the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience. Um, this past Monday, a blog post that had a, a ton of traction is uh, what I called 10 ways for creators to prevent a mythic meltdown. So recently, 
there, there's kind of been a trend of some projects that take longer than normal and then when it comes time to actually fulfill them they ask for a lot more money than originally estimated for shipping and they ask for a lot they, some of them have asked for the possibility of more funds um for uh for other costs for manufacturing costs for for money that the company just doesn't have anymore to afford making the game and the mythic games recently asked backers uh or didn't really ask backers they did it a little differently because they didn't say hey this is an option for you to do they said we cannot we will not make your game unless you pay more money which i think was uh was not received well for a variety of reasons i was aware of this and i wanted to focus I wanted to write about the topic because I think it's been on people's minds a lot lately. It's been part of the conversation of board games. And I wanted to write about it in a, in a positive and constructive way. Not positive about Mythic Games. I definitely don't condone their behavior at all. But I wanted to help other creators who might see this and be concerned about the possibility of encountering a similar situation in the future as well. And so I wrote a post about 10 ways that you can prevent this from happening. And some of the main core points here that, that I'll highlight very briefly. One... Um, try not to launch your project until it is as close to complete as possible. And I heard another creator mention that this can be difficult advice for creators who haven't finished the art yet and are you going to, and plan on using some of the funds as is completely reasonable using some of those funds for their art budget. Um, however, I think it is still possible to finish 99% of the game design and development aside from the art and then have you know a two to three month plan to finish the art before going to production but the more the closer you get to having a game be production ready the less uncertainty you lead to the in the future um and the tighter the gap you 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 offer to backers so that there's less of a time for manufacturing costs and freight shipping costs and fulfillment costs to actually change in the future that's one two um if you are a repeat creator as mythic games is as many creators are now find ongoing revenue streams and use those revenue streams like lo localization partners, relationships with retailers and distributors, um, your own web store, use those revenue streams to fund your monthly bills so that you are not ever using your projects, your crowdfunding projects to fund those bills. The promise of those crowdfunding projects is to create one specific project um, or one specific product, not to fund your ongoing expenses. Um, and three, that, that, Pigeonhole and uh, piggybacking off of that general idea that I just said of using the funds for for one project for that project itself. Don't use those funds for other projects to fund other projects and don't spend money that you don't have, basically. So um, I think that that post resonated with a lot of people in different ways. I definitely have empathy for backers of the the six siege Kickstarter campaign that are that are that are in a rough patch right now. They're, they're in a tough spot that Mythic Games has presented them with. Um, I have that, but I'm also trying to obviously focus on the positive um, and constructive nature of helping other creators avoid that same situation in the future. Paul said he's recently purchased the entire Viticulture series. Thank you, Paul, for doing that. He says, would you recommend starting with just the base game for first-time players? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that. I think the, the answer that you will get if you post that elsewhere, Paul, is put Tuscany in right away. I highly recommend not doing that. Viticulture by itself I think ha has worked out pretty well. It, it, it is a, a really solid, well, I, I feel weird saying this because I designed it. I think it works really well for um, for new and even experienced gamers um, who, who are playing Viticulture for the first time. And by not adding in Tuscany right away, you give yourself the opportunity to kind of level up once you get to Tuscany. Um, and so, yeah, I highly recommend starting with just the Viticulture base game and then adding other layers as you continue to play. Probably the easiest things to add after that are, um, are the more other vid visitor cards, but Tuscany is when you're ready to kind of level up and take the game to the, the next level. Um, yeah, Paul says he seems to recall there was a feature in an expansion that everyone says make for a better game experience. So what Tuscany does is it gives you all, all four seasons become worker placement seasons instead of just two of them, but it significantly increases the decision space because you can only place each worker once per year, and there, there are new actions to kind of keep track of. So I highly recommend playing with Viticulture first, even if it's just one game or two games, and then add Tuscany later. Um, Viticulture by itself is a highly acclaimed game. I, this is how I can say it without being biased, but I think it works very well by itself, and it also works even better when you add Tuscany when you're ready for that. 
Uh, Nathan says, I think a video about the development process would be cool. This is one aspect of the business that not many people cover. So yeah, so I see what you're saying, Nathan. So that's a little bit different than what I was mentioning earlier, but a, a game, uh, a video about how to develop a game, which you're right, is, is different than designing a game. Development is taking a game that has already been designed and making it even more fun, even more intuitive, even more balanced, um, even more streamlined often. Um, and you're right, I, I, I should do a video on that because I haven't talked about game development a lot. Let me make a note about that. Game development. And right now seems like a good time. I see some other comments here, but let me chime in with my question of the day for you right now. Uh, I have some other news as well to share. Yeah, I'll, I'll go through some stuff. But my question for you is, what is the last time that you can think of that a company made you feel awesome or clever as a customer? Um, this is a post that I've been thinking about writing and I don't know the exact angle that I want to approach it with. And let me look at how I phrased it. But yeah, I saw a YouTube video about how to make users awesome, users of your product, customers of your, of your product. And so it's, I guess it's not just about the, the purchase point. That is maybe one of the points where you, a company could make you feel awesome. But, uh, the other points are when you're actually using the product that you purchased or using the, the service that you hired, that you purchased. Um, and while doing so, the way that that service is designed or developed makes you feel awesome. I know it's kind of a vague question, but I, I don't know. I'm, I want to throw it out there. If you can think of anything recent where, um, where you felt awesome based on an experience you had. And I'll throw a tiny one in there. I, yesterday, I went to see Guardians of the Galaxy, the third volume three with Megan at a theater. And we went to the, the local, the new Alamo Draft House. And I think the Alamo Draft House does a lot of little things to make you feel pretty awesome. Uh, the seats are really comfortable. Um, you you order food from where you're sitting, so you don't ever have to get up. You just push a button and you write things on a menu. I don't know if it ever really makes you feel incredibly clever, but it makes you feel special at least. Or I, I feel special when I go to the Alamo Draft House. I, I feel like I'm being treated to something. Um, and yeah, I, I I I just have I've had a really good experience the, the first two times that I've been to the Alamo Draft House. So that's one for me. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that subject. Justin is here. He says, you have mentioned a few times how Breath of the Wild has inspired you and an upcoming, inspired an upcoming open world game that, that I'm designing. It has, yeah, quite a bit. Um, its sequel, Tears of the Kingdom, releases on Friday. It does indeed. Are you looking forward to seeing that game's ideas too? And could they inform your design for the open world? Yeah, Justin, I, I certainly wish that my open world game had been completed in the many years that have passed between the first Zelda Breath of the Wild and the sequel, I, but uh, but Nintendo, uh, <laughs> they somehow, I, I, it's not on Nintendo, it's on me for taking so long to create this game. I, I've designed a very, very big game here in my open world game. But yes, I am very excited to see, and I know some things already, but I'm excited to see detailed designer style reviews about Tears of the Kingdom. Um, and it is possible that certain elements, I, I watched what's out there so far, and there are elements of the game that are already in, um, that are already in my game. And uh, yeah, I, I don't wanna say what they are, but yeah, there are elements that are already in the game, but there are, what I'm specifically, what I'll specifically probably be looking for at this point are any really cool abilities that uh, Link, uh, abilities slash items that Link can add now that he can do um, that I haven't thought of for my game. And I'm, I might consider adding them as like individual cards in the game, individual you know, abilities or, or items, things like that. Again, I don't wanna to go too much, too much into spoilers for my game, but yes, I will be looking to the game for inspiration, similar to how I've looked at other open world games like Ghosts of Tsushima, um, Elden Ring. I've looked at those games as well, highly acclaimed open world games to uh, inspire some ideas for my game. Good morning, Susanna. My coworker Susanna is here today. I'm looking forward to seeing some of my coworkers, or one coworker, Dave, and our friend Henry today for a game of Wishland. I'm going to learn and play Wishland this afternoon. Hopefully, do a video about it. I did see. I I have never played my original Kickstarter copy of Wishland, and now it's being reprinted with a new Kickstarter campaign. So, I wanted to check that out. Also, I backed the new game Raising Robots. And uh, I have a guest post from, I believe Seth wrote a guest post for that, that will go live tomorrow. It, uh, I'm loving these tableau building games that make you feel really in and increasingly powerful over the course of the game. Arc Nova, Wingspan, Earth, and Raising Robots seems to do a similar thing with their game. 
Sean says, am I sending expeditions to BGG Spring? I asked last week and I was hoping that maybe you changed your mind. Um, Sean, I can't remember what I said last week about it, but I, I, I'm sending, oh, what, I'm sending a copy to Tom Vassell to review and then put into Dice Tower West. Um, but I only have one copy right now, Sean. All other copies are reserved for reviewers. So the only copy that I have available is my copy of Expeditions, and I need that copy to film some video about it. So um, I, I doubt there will be one at BGG Spring. I will see if I have an extra copy incoming. I'm expecting to get a copy right before Geekway, and I might be able to send one of those copies to, to BGG Spring. Specifically, if they have a play and win section, that's how we typically send games to conventions, if people want to try that there. Uh, Sean, remind me of the dates for that so I can see if if it, if it isn't too late. Sam is here. He says, hey, Sam, any tips for finding productivity when going through emotionally challenging events outside of work? That's a great question, Sam, but I, if you're struggling with something right now, um, my thoughts are with you. Uh, that's a great question. When, you're, when your mind, when your heart is on other things, how can you... How can you stay focused on 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 I don't know moving forward with with your job or um, job like hobbies that are important to you? That's a great question, Sam. Um, I know when I'm having kind of an emotionally tumultuous day or week, it it is definitely tough to focus and be productive. Um, so I'm trying to think of what I've done. I don't. I don't know if I. I don't. I don't know if I have a great answer for that. I've definitely struggled in those times when my mind's on other things, um, and sometimes it's work related. Sometimes it's work related stress that I'm that I'm experiencing, and it's hard for me to break out of that and focus on what I need to do. So I don't know, Sam. I I love that question. I don't have an answer for it, but I, I th I'm glad that you asked it, and I'm wondering if anyone out there has an answer that uh, from their experience. I'd love for people to speak from their experience. Not, you don't need to share anything personal, um, but something that something specific that you have found that you can do to move forward with your jobs or job-like hobbies um, when uh, when you have stressful or emotionally difficult things going on in your life. I think that's an excellent question, Sam, and a, a great one for for uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. Nancy Jane, she says that she just received her copy of Darwin's Journey. I'm really excited to receive my copy as well. She says the box is beautiful. Yeah, that uh, Thunder Griff always makes beautiful games, in my opinion. And I, I can't wait to get my copy of that. Joshua's here. Good morning, Joshua. Uh, Melissa says, I like the way you do games. Thank you, Melissa. I am never doing Kickstarter or anything like it again. I have not had good experiences there. I'm sorry to hear that, Melissa. I, I really am. Um, I think the sad thing about this experience with with mythic games is that there are a lot of companies that do that put their backers first on Kickstarter and crowdfunding. Um, and when companies like this mess up, uh, they they impact all of those other creators who are doing their best to serve backers. And so um, I think that's that's a really unfortunate impact on it. And Melissa, I'm glad that you like the way that we do things in general. Our method is that we make a product and we announce it after we've made it. We talk about it for a few weeks and then it's ready. We're ready to sell it to you and ship it to you. Sometimes we have broken from that a little bit. Like we broke for that from that method with the recent nesting box, third printing, um, because we wanted to make sure that we made one for everybody who wanted to, who wanted one. Same thing for expeditions. We we uh, uh, the game itself was finished, but we wanted to. In fact, it was kind of already in production, but we wanted to make sure we were making it enough for people. We're getting closer on expeditions. We're we are in mid May right now. We're almost in mid May. And expeditions should wrap up production in just a few weeks and start shipping out to fulfillment centers. Also, we have some back and stock information. Uh, this is relevant for the U.S. and it will soon become relevant for the other regions that we serve: uh, Europe, Canada, and Australia, Asia, and New Zealand. Um, we have Wingspan Asia back in stock. Uh, the Le size legendary box. It's been a while. That is finally back in stock. We're coming back in stock for those other regions. Back in stock in the U.S. though. The size legendary box. We have Between Two Cities Essential Edition back in stock and the Red Rising Upgrade Pack. So the pack that takes a standard version of Red Rising and turns it into the Collector's Edition. And it uses the, the newly painted tokens that are easier to tell apart. Uh, they better match the colors in the, in the normal version, but they are metal, so they feel extra nice. Um, 
Yeah, all that stuff is back in stock or will very soon be back in stock in your region. If you go to the web store in like Canada and you don't see it back in stock yet, just sign up for a back in stock notification and it really will be back in stock very, very soon. Um, that's always the method though. Sign up for a back in stock notification. That's helpful for us to communicate to you when something is back in stock and it informs us for certain products that we need to make more of it after we see a critical mass of people who have signed up for those back in stock notifications. Uh, I've done some playtesting recently, playtesting for a game that I'm working on, playtesting for a game that I'm co-designing, and also did a playtest for a game submission, and I had some feedback for the, from the designer. Really good game that I'm considering. I'm right on the fence on, but I often, uh, when I'm on the fence about something, I offer feedback to the designer and see how they respond, see how they're, they're open to constructive criticism, and see what they do with that feedback, because I want to see them act on it a little bit, hopefully. Not all of it. It's okay if they push back on some of it. But if I see something that needs that I would need to be different to consider publishing it, um, I, I want to see how the designer works with me. Because the way that we do development at Stillmire Games is that it's not that a designer just hands off a game to us and we take it from there. We actively work with a designer over many, many months to make the game as good as possible. And I think it's really important for the designer to stay involved in that process, heavily involved, because they know the game better than we do. Um, so I've done a little bit of that recently. Uh, Jerry says, since you are making Expeditions Metal Mechs, will you be restocking more Scythe Metal Mechs for sale as well? We are doing that. Jerry, let me look at the schedule for those Metal Mechs to see when we're expecting to have more of them in stock. Because I know they're, I know they're in, in the works. Or maybe we already sold out of them. Let's see. Um... Go, 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 go look and look back in time here a little bit. So, you know, I'm kind of showing Jerry that they should already be back in stock, or maybe just back in stock very, very soon. Those are the dates. Yeah, I'm seeing. Okay, yeah. So they, they should be back in stock quite soon. Um, I will make a note about that. So definitely, yeah, sign up for a back in stock notification for the Scythe, the Metal Mechs. They should be back in stock in the very near future. And I will talk to Joe and Alex about that schedule. I'm showing that they should have shipped out of China last month. Um, there's also the base snaps for them. I'm going to look in one other place while I'm live here to see if they are actually incoming. Where do we have this? We have many, many Google Docs that we use for this information. Here we go. What are we looking at for Metal Mechs? There we go, Metal Mechs. Due to arrive in late June. Um, and that's at least in the US. Other from the centers might be slightly earlier or later. So yeah, late June for that. So yeah, they, they are, they are incoming. They are incoming. Kind of, we're in the pre-ship stage right now. They should actually ship out early next week out of China. So they're a little bit behind schedule, but not too much. Uh, board, ga board Game Zone says, what's the new game that you're working on? I appreciate your curiosity for sure. I, I don't reveal games that I'm working on, uh, or at least specifics about games that I'm like actively working on until um, until we release them. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm working on a couple games right now. One by myself, one with a co-designer. And I'm working on development for a few other games. I'm also working on an expansion right now. Sorry to be vague, but uh, I don't want to say something. I, I never want to say something and, and have uh, and have it change significantly. Like that, there's one game that I'm actually working on now that we worked on a couple of years ago in a completely different format. And if I talked too much about it, you might have gotten excited about it, and then asked about like why is it delayed or whatnot. And I don't want to get into that sort of thing until we've actually moved forward with the, with the game. Uh, that's the time that it really matters. Until then, everything is just hypothetical. George says he really liked the clever puzzles before the Andromeda's Edge campaign. And George, yeah, you reminded me. I asked ambassadors recently for um, some things that they've, they, that they've seen other projects do, other creators, other projects, other publishers that they just really enjoyed. I have a long list of those things that I'm going to highlight in an upcoming blog post. Not, not, uh, not tomorrow, but maybe next Monday I'll do a post like that. And Andromeda's Edge was mentioned. The puzzles in that one were mentioned there. Oh, I see. Uh, so George is answering the question that I asked. I totally forgot that I asked this question, but when was the last time that a that a project or a product or a company made you as a customer or a user feel awesome? Um, and George is answering that question. Joshua says he also likes when board games include riddles or puzzles. He said Gloomhaven comes to mind. Make, makes me feel clever when I figure it out. Um, 
And I'm curious, you know, I was randomly thinking about that same topic, Joshua, today. I didn't get deep enough into Gloomhaven. Uh, it wasn't really the, the right fit of a game for me in terms of the tactical combat focus. But I've heard that there were a lot of, like, subtle puzzles and mysteries to solve in the game that, were, that weren't just tactical combat. And I'm wondering, are you aware of any video that goes over all of those different puzzles? A video or a podcast or, or, a, uh, or a blog that goes over and reveals all of those hidden puzzles in Gloomhaven. I'd love to watch that. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go through the game to play them and find them myself, but I'd, I'd love to see what a creator thinks about them. So if anyone knows of such a video, let me know. I'd, I'd love to see, to watch that. Thank you, Sean, for clarifying that board game, BGG Spring is May 26th through May 29th. George, uh, or Sean, I will leave myself a note for next Wednesday to maybe send a copy of Expeditions to BGG Spring. I will try my best to do that. I need to find a contact at BGG Spring to, uh, to ask about that. Um, but yeah, I will work on that, George. I, th I think I will have a copy next week that I might be able to use for that purpose. Joshua says that he also loves puzzles hidden in crowdfunding campaigns. Here we go. Nancy James says, The Guinness Open Gate Brewery made us feel great during the pandemic. During lockdown, they created a takeout service for their beers, including the specialty flavors, which were only on tap before. Later on, they put tables in the large outdoor area outside the building. There were tents over each table and they were widely spaced. So they didn't just make you feel awesome. They made you feel safe, um, which I think is wonderful, Nancy Jane. Waiters came to the tables or you could order online using a QR code and the food and drinks were delivered to the table. They also had movies outside. I love hearing that. That is a great example. And I, I like that you've expanded this idea from just feeling awesome to feeling safe, to feeling taken care of. Um, I'm going to make a note about that. Let's see. Not just awesome, but also safe. And uh, I'll throw in the word pampered. I don't know if that's quite the word that I'm thinking of, but that's what I'm kind of saying by taking care of. And pampered is one way to say that. If you think of a better word than that, let me know. I think pampered has the connotation of being spoiled, but uh, I don't know. I think it's okay for self-care and whatnot to be pampered sometimes. Megan says, does sending something to Tom Vassell ever make you nervous? Oh, of course, sending anything to any reviewer makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> Megan says, his reviews always seem all over the place to me. Personally, out of the Dice Star folks, I, I feel like Chris and Wendy and Z are pretty consistent and always keep things nice, even if they give a game a not-so-nice score. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't highlight Tom specifically. I can see where you're coming from there, Megan. But yeah, whenever, um, whenever I send out a, a new Stillmeyer product, whether I'm the designer or not, as much as I love it, and this is, I think, why I'm so nervous, because I only create things that I that I love. We only publish things that I really, really do love and that I put a ton of time and effort and resources into. And I'm always curious and nervous what reviewers will think. We, we always send our games out, and I very rarely even know what reviewers say, which helps with my nervousness to a certain extent. But I know that sometimes reviewers can make or break the, the success of a game, um, especially particularly influential reviewers like Tom Vassell. So... Absolutely, I'm nervous. Always. Every time. Jason says that he is a vet. Since getting back from my deployment, my board game nights have really helped me adjust back to civilian life. I love hearing that, Jason. Games have been therapeutic. Just wanted to, th to say thank you for your games. They've been a huge help. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jason. Thank you for your service. And um, I'm glad that games have provided that, uh, that refuge for you, that joyous place for you to, um, to make that transition. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, thank you for just chiming in and sharing that. I really appreciate it. Susanna, okay, so uh, there was a question earlier that I didn't have a great answer to. Um, I, although I guess Jason is somewhat answering this question. The answer of uh, when you have something stressful or emotionally uh, tumultuous going on in your life, how can you stay productive? How can you find focus? How can you find joy in, in the work that you're doing? Susanna says, personally, I found that... Sharing what I'm going through with a trusted friend, possibly even crying through it, helps to release the emotions. Helps me find footing to refocus on tasks at hand. Acknowledging and honoring emotional difficulties can help me gain clarity on the size of those feelings and helps put them in perspective. Then I can move forward, sometimes just in a small way, instead of feeling stuck in the emotional challenge. Uh, I, I love every bit of this, Susanna. Uh, the idea of uh, speaking, speaking your truth, speaking those emotions to someone else, whether it's a friend, um, a therapist, someone who uh, who is willing to listen and you're, that you feel comfortable speaking those things to. Uh, I'm so glad you said that. I, I think that's a wonderful way to put it. Um, and it's a good reminder to me because I oftentimes when I'm in those moments, 
I, I try to just forge ahead. You know, I try to, I try to push them aside almost. Um, uh, not that I'm not an emotive person. I, 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 I very much feel those things and I'm open to expressing them. But in the moment where I'm like, I just have to write this blog post right now. I, I just, I, I have to, I have to work on this game design right now. That's when I kind of often separate those things instead of just taking a moment, taking an hour, taking some time to talk about them with somebody else. Um, I, that can make me much more productive because sometimes I know for sure in those moments of stress and emotional turmoil, especially when it's often related to work, maybe a mistake that I made that I'm dealing with. Um, that if I do try to charge ahead, my, the quality of my work is so much lower. My level of product productivity is so much lower because my brain is still trying to solve this problem that it can't really solve, that it, it, it's trying to process something that I haven't actually processed. So actually taking the time to process it can make me better at my job in the end. Um, yeah, so I'm so glad you mentioned that, Susanna. That, that's lovely advice. Nancy Jane does say that the uh, the Guinness Open Gate Brewery that she recommends here is in the Baltimore area, in case anyone is curious about that. Quince said, have I tried the new Nauvoo Games Raising Robots that is on Kickstarter? I haven't tried it, no, but I did back it um, because I think it fits this tableau thing going on in board games that I'm really loving. Um, Brian, uh, Megan also adds on to Nancy Jane's comment that uh, Manor Hill. She says they're farm brewery. Oh, I like the idea of a farm brewery. It's so nice. Brian says, I'm excited for the upcoming release of, of Expeditions. Thank you, Brian, for being excited about that. Thematically, what are the characters doing when they're vanquishing corruption and melding meteors? So with melding meteors, you're actually taking this uh, otherworldly meteorite chunk and you are actually melding it. Like, uh, uh, yeah, I think meld is the correct word here. Like, uh, melding it to your mech. You're actually like... Uh, I think I think melding is the word. What's the word when you when you yeah you take you use like flame or fire really uh, uh, heat and you're you're sticking it to your mech, and that is kind of it's almost enchanting the mech in the way that you're sticking the meteorite to it. What are the characters doing when they're vanquishing corruption? They're either using power or guile to remove a problem. So if you're using power, that might mean uh, it, it, it depends exactly on 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 the quest sometimes or when you're vanquishing corruption it's just you're removing something so you're taking something corrupted which might be a possessed animal and you are using force to get rid of it so maybe you're killing it maybe you are um physically removing the corruption from it if you can uh you're, you're kind of using force there um, or you are subduing it um, with guile you're kind of outsmarting it you're getting it to go away by outsmarting that corruption so again maybe i'll use the example of a uh, a corrupted tree um that maybe have maybe has some level of intelligence you are outwitting that tree so it no longer is either is no longer corrupted or is no longer a, a problem for that area of the land um, yeah that's the the general idea there Nancy Jane says that she loves the Discord and Twitch playthroughs that Thunder Griff Games does. Talking about things that make you feel clever or valued as a user. Value, there's another word I can use. Might be better than pampered. Mark always pops in. So Mark, you always pop in and say, what did I miss? It's always hard to, to recap what you've missed. Um, because we, we jump around to so many different topics here in the live cast. But I'll, I'll give you a few little things that I've talked about. I talked about uh, the Star Cruiser video that I did this past weekend. Talked a little bit about um, how to prevent uh, what's happening with Mythic Games as a creator. I talked about this that, that blog post. We're talking about, um, uh, Sam asked a great question about how to be productive when you are really stressed or you're going through an emotionally tumultuous period of, of your life or, t or, or week or day. Um, I also asked the question, to everyone, what is the last time that a product or project or company or creator or person made you feel awesome as a user or customer? Um, and what is it about the product or, or service or whatever it is that made you feel awesome in that way? Um, I talked about some things that are back in stock that we have Wingspan Asia back in stock, Legendary Box, Between Two Cities Essential Edition, and the Red Rising Upgrade Pack. And if they aren't back in stock in your region yet, it is going to be very, very soon. We're, we're seeing those shipments arrive this week and next week. Yeah, that's what we've been talking about. It's tough to do the recap though, Mark. I think in the future when you when you pop in, 
Um, I, I I will try to use that as a good reminder to maybe include to recap a few, a few of the things that we talked about to include more people. Um, but it, I also you can also just kind of flip through the video and look at different topics along the way because you can go back in real time I think and look at and start the video from the beginning if you want and see some of the things that we've been talking about. Sean says Borgy Meat can uh, oh he's tagging Borgy Meat to reach out about BGG Spring. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Quint says, you're welcome to send all of your games to the SaltCon game library. There's a summer SaltCon from June 2nd to 4th. And I should say, forever, I'm glad I appreciate that invitation to Quint's. We don't actually send games to game libraries. What we do is we send games to play and win sections. Uh, so play and win at a convention is when a convention hosts an area, um, sometimes accepting donations from publishers, sometimes buying games for the play and win area, where people can go check out a game like you would from a library, but those people get to win the game or uh, one person, one lucky person will win the game that they played at the end of the convention. Uh, this gives people kind of a strong and compelling reason to play specific games. Whereas in a library, it's nice to have a gaming library. I love conventions that have gaming libraries, but there isn't a sense of urgency to actually play the games. So I think it's much more helpful for publishers if you offer play and win because it gives people a reason to check out your game and check it out right away now and play it now because they get a chance to win it so we contribute to play and win sections if you are interested in that as a convention or you go to a convention that you wish had a play and win section for that reason uh, i have information about that on our website you can search the stonebar games website for um uh, uh i have a recent fairly recent post about about play and win that you can look at there's there's a google doc too there's stuff under events convention conventions and events where you can find that google doc there's ways for conventions to sign up and it's not just for us to see it it's for any publisher to see uh, what play and win sections are available at at upcoming conventions carol says that she's seen positive commentary on expeditions from people who played it at gamma it has been fun to, to see a little bit of that yeah carol says that susanna is a fantastic listener i absolutely agree um in fact i'm kind of blessed with the, a whole team of people who are wonderful listeners uh, on my my team susanna dave joe alex yeah they're I, I am fortunate to have such wonderful coworkers in that way. Welding, thank you, Miles. I'm thinking melding. Yeah, welding is the word I'm thinking of, of how you use heat to affix one thing to another thing. Um, so yeah, you're essentially welding it, your meteorite in expeditions to your mech. Um, and then it is melded, it is, it is part of your mech at that point. Uh, and it's not just like a rock stuck to the mech. It, it is physically a rock stuck to the mech, but it's the powers in that meteorite are impacting your mech from then on. Melissa says, oh, thank you, Melissa, for popping in from Tantrum House. She says, I really enjoyed my plays of Raising Robots. This is a new project from Navu Games that I backed earlier this week. She says she loves the simultaneous play and engine building. Sounds a little bit like Earth there, but with robots, which sounds awesome. She says the Tantrum House crew will have a live playthrough on YouTube on Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you can't join us live, it will be available to watch on our, afterward on our channel. Thank you so much for sharing that, Melissa. I really, really appreciate that for anyone who's curious about that campaign. Paul says, what percentage of your online orders add an autographed card? I always add one for fun and wondered how many others do the same. I don't know the percentage offhand, Paul. I know that I, I am signing them more frequently now than I used to in the past. Um, I think I sign, I do it every three months. Usually I, I put on a movie or something and just sign a bunch of cards. It takes me a few hours to sign I don't know, 300, 400, 500 cards. But I'm glad you're enjoying that. I'm glad it's a fun little thing for you to add to your, to your order. And if people don't know, know, don't know what Paul's talking about, um, for on our website, you can add one signed card to your order. We ask people just to limit it to one. It's just a dollar. We don't, we're not looking to, to really make money off of it. It's just, you know, it's an added expense for the fulfillment company to physically find the, find the card and put it in. And it's a random card. So you can't request a specific card. It's always just random. And they're just cards from games that I've designed that I or co-designed that I've signed and sent to or have Dave sent to different fulfillment centers to uh, to fulfill. So if you look for I think it's listed as like signed cards, maybe autographed cards, but I think it's signed cards on our web store. That's how you can get signed things from from me if that's something that you value. Thanks for mentioning that, Paul. Donna says that she does the same thing. Uh, Mark says, just want to say thanks to Jamie for selecting one of his fan realms for game 50. Yes, Mark mentioned, um, so this week I'm doing live plays of game 49 for Rolling Realms, but we also have now put together the nine fan realms. I picked one from uh, nine different designers, 
and I will be playing through them as the, the live play for game 50 in two weeks. I'm really looking forward to doing that. Looks like some really cool fan realms in there. Uh, I had I had people nominate different fan, fan realms. I think we had around 22 that were nominated and I whittled them down to nine for this live play and I'll do another nine for game 60 many, many months in the future. But uh, yeah, thank you, Mark, for submitting so many great and great looking designs. I think it helps when it's a really nice, clean, intuitive design. Um, that, that's a big help for me when I'm doing the live play because I, I kind of learn them on the fly as I'm doing that. If you want to join that live play, I have a post about it. I think I have it in multiple places. I put it in the Rolling Realms Facebook group on Board Game Geek and in our Discord channel, our Discord server, about that live play. And we have a printout. You can just print out three different pages, one of each for each of the fan realms, the sets of fan realms, the rounds of, of fan realms to join that game 50 in a few weeks. But if you already have realms, again, today's live play will be for the Isle of Cats, Ark Nova, and Biddy and Walter. That'll be today's live play coming up in a few hours. Not right away after this, but a few, later this afternoon, it'll be at three o'clock central time. So right now it's 1045, so it'll be in about four hours from now. Nathan says that he also adds the signed cards to each order, and he's never had a duplicate yet. That's good. That's good. I've, it's, yeah, I, I enjoy doing it. I, I was going to say something about other designers. It's something that I have, I, at one point I asked another designer to do it, and I was really hesitant to ask, and the designer didn't, lo didn't love the idea and didn't do it. So I haven't asked our other designers to do it, but I only feel comfortable signing cards for games that I was heavily inv involved with as a designer or a co-designer. So um, those are currently the only cards available there, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a little fun thing. That's all it is. Quinn says, uh, a friend of mine has a game that is ready to be published and he told me that three companies are interested in this game. That's awesome. Congratulations to your friend there, Quince. One person who is big in the industry said his game could win the Spiel Award, the Spiel de Yars Award, and he is wondering if he should self-publish or go with a company. If he goes with a company, what should he be asking for as a designer? Also, he did all the artwork for his game. Um, I think I know the game that you're talking about, Quince. Um, I think it's neat when a designer does the artwork, too. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily something that some people should try to do because oftentimes a, a publisher might find what they believe is the right artist for the game. But if it's the game that, that I'm thinking of, I think the artist did, the designer did a great job with the art. Um, as for self-publishing versus publishing, I, I don't know. That, that's a big question. That's a big question. I have some blog posts about that. The, the big question is, do you want to run a business or do you want to design, and in this case, illustrate a game? Two very different things. One requires a lot of risk and responsibility. The other does not. Um, I would... Never, ever think about the, I, I don't know how to say this, but uh, thinking about the possibility of winning an award should be so far off your radar at any point in the design process. For sure, for me too. Like I, I never make a game thinking, oh, this might win an award because the odds are heavily stacked against you that your game will even be considered. And if that's your motivation, um, not, it's not that motivation in this case, but if that becomes a part of your motivation a little bit, I think it warps. I think it warps your your motivations a little bit um, because odds are it's not going to happen, and so you you are setting yourself up for disappointment most likely. So, uh, I be wary of that. Be careful of that. Um, is my recommendation. As for what should you be asking for as a designer? I have a blog post about that too, of course, I always do, about um, game design contracts. So let me see if I can find that link real quick. This list, the types of things that they should keep in mind. Here we go. I use kind of our template as the core example here, but here I'll post a link for things for your designer friend to think about. But yeah, most importantly, I think the question is, do they want to run a company or do they want to be a designer slash artist? Two very different things. If your friend is having fun being a designer and an artist, uh, I, I would not suggest going the publishing route, but if they are excited about the publishing aspect and running a business, the entrepreneurship, the connecting with the customers, the risk that comes with it, sometimes added profits that come with it, but oftentimes risk, um, then go with that. that that's, that's the key decision point there. 
Donna says that Keith from Role Player Adventures off, uh, some, sometimes signs cards as well. And also, I should say, even though we do charge a dollar for signed cards on our web store, if you ever see me in real life, of course I'm happy to sign something for you. I don't charge anything for that at all. I, I, I am flattered that you would even ask me to sign something. So I'm always happy to do that if you run into me in person. This is our answer because sometimes people have asked me to like sign a rule book and send it to them. And that involves a whole, I don't know, it's a whole thing for me to do that. Uh, but it's very easy for me to sit down for a few hours and just sign a bunch of cards and then give them to our fulfillment centers to include within orders. That's within our, that's somewhat within our, our natural fulfillment system, our optimized fulfillment system. Mark says, can a Rolling Realms card be a random signed card or not because of the dry erase feature? You know, Mark, that's a good question. I haven't ever signed a Rolling, the Rolling Realms cards. Uh, but I certainly could. I don't see why not. You're right. People might think that it's something that they can erase and they can't, but yeah, maybe I'll try to remember that next time. I think, I think it could, I think the permanent marker would stay on a Rolling Realms card. Okay. But I'll, I'll test that out and see. It's a good question. George says, how about signing some Charterstone sticker cards? Yeah, that's another game that I have not signed because it's just full of spoilers. Charterstone is, so I haven't signed that one. So I think that's all the topics I was going to cover today. Um, thank you all for joining me for this for this live cast. I love your questions. I love your answers as always. And um, yeah, let me make a note. I always try to put in the header like some of the topics that we covered in the video so that, that I, people know what they're watching when they look at this on YouTube. So I'll try to include that. There were some great questions here today. Making users feel awesome. The idea of stress and emotions. Maybe those will be the two. I'll find one other one. Maybe back in stock could be the other one. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday and I will see you next Wednesday right before I get busy for a few days at Geekway to the West here in St. Louis, the convention that I'm attending. So yeah, have a great day and a great week. I'll see you later. Bye.